So <clears throat> we are going to get started and welcome to the 2021 my core stream training. Uh, this has been a program that has been um, it's been continual since 2005, though just the last three years we, we haven't held this training uh, because of budgetary reasons. So it's really good to be back um, and to a chance to revisit this material, to freshen it up after a little bit of a break. And, you know, it's uh, at the end stages of COVID here. So we're also, uh, this is the first time I've done this training, 30 people or so uh, across the state that lead these MyCore macroinvertebrate monitoring programs with volunteers. So we're a rare breed. It's nice to have colleagues and to be able to get to know all of you and work with you on, on this. Uh, also joining us this year is Tamara Lipsy. And I'm gonna, Tamara, if you wanna pop in so that you can just say hi and talk about your role here. Hi hey everyone, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can. Uh, so for those who are watching the recording stuff, but it's going to start again, uh, the one of our hosts lost internet for a second, but it's back. So don't worry. Um, my name is Tamara Lipsy and I work with the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Um, and my role is to be the liaison for the MyCorp program. Um, many of you may have known Marcy wilness Snow and um, she is still with Eagle, but she's doing has different responsibilities. So, I've been with Eagle for 18 years and am familiar with the MyCore program. But I'm really enjoying um, getting to know the ins and outs of it and interacting with volunteers on a regular basis. It's been really nice to talk to people um, from outside of my department, um, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, teaching macroinvertebrates to you later today. Yep, thank you. All right. So we're going to just kind of jump into it and talk about some changes that, that have uh, been put into my core. Um, first of all, as, as many of you know, because I've been emailing you and bothering you this past year, we are now uh, requiring that QAPs are reviewed every two years, approved by me um, as a way of kind of maintaining your good standing with the organization. So one new thing that, that every new QAP or re newly uh, reviewed QAP will have in it is invasive species decontamination. So that's, that's a piece that we now require all groups to do. Um, and it should go into your your procedures and something you do after every site so that you know we're doing our best to as a group to uh monitor water water, water quality and you know if we were to be the ones who spread invasive species that would just be a disaster so we're doing everything we can that so it's not us um that's responsible for that because we you know we're we're in streams constantly, right? So there'd be a good chance for our groups to be doing that spreading. So that is now in QAPS. Uh, another thing we have are these maintenance grants, and many of you have them. Uh, just this past grant cycle, we gave out 19 of these maintenance grants, and it's just a little bit of money, and I recognize that. It's between $1,000, $2,000. It's meant so that you at least have uh, enough money coming in for staffing and equipment to, to keep your uh, gear up to, to snuff so that you can do things like attend these trainings and get paid for it. Uh, so you can go to the conference, basically so you can stay connected with the MyCore network. And those grants will happen every year. So that's the kind of thing that you can get on a continual basis. Now, to get those, you do have to have that quap in, a, in an active state and be a member in good standing. Um, because it's such a low amount of money, there's we have very little administration um, uh, expectations on you. Basically, we're not asking for quarterly reports or anything like that. 
just that at the end of the calendar year, you'll do a one page fact sheet and you'll you, uh, that you'll turn into me and you'll um, also do uh, the, the financial form to get your reimbursement. So it's just a one time reimbursement of that, that amount of money. Um, normally we'll have $20,000 each year to give out these maintenance grants. Uh, this grant cycle, we gave out 30,000. Uh, it was the first year we did it. And I um, also coming back after a break, we actually only gave out one of those bigger implementation grants. So we had more money available for the maintenance grants. But I would imagine in future years that, the, that these maintenance grants will be a little more competitive we will probably only have that $20,000. So, uh, you know, even though it's a very short application, make it high quality, uh, make sure you meet all those requirements because there's a higher chance in future years that you will actually not be able to get this money. Um, so treat that as a, as a competitive grant and know that it's certainly not guaranteed. Okay, but the big topic for today is to talk about changes to our uh, identification and scoring scheme. Um, this is the reason it's a big topic is because we've been doing the same thing since the program launched in, in 2005. So uh, many of us have just been very accustomed to this data sheet that we've seen it over and over and over and over again. And it's maybe a second nature, but we're going to change it um, and why are we doing, why is the MyCore doing this? Um, it's because there are certain problems within the way we have been doing things. And it's just a good opportunity with the long break uh, and the more, and me having more time to work on the program to institute these changes so that we are more uh, biologically accurate and developing a system that is uh, easy for the volunteers to do. So that's what we're going to talk about. So in our current system, what we have are uh, these uh, organic uh, pollution indicator groups. You know, we have the sensitive group, we have the somewhat sensitive group, and we have the tolerant group. Um, so they're, they're grouped into these categories. And that was done for, for kind of ease of use for the volunteers to get a sense of where these groups are. But the reality is uh, this whole thing is a continuum. Um, for example, the guild right-handed ha snails, while those snails are more sensitive than other types of snails, they're probably a lot less, they're probably less sensitive than most of the somewhat sensitive group. So there's some errors in here that we can, can work on uh, correcting. Uh, furthermore, the scoring system itself is mostly mathematical. You'll notice that the poor, fair, good, excellent categories, those are mostly just divided into fourths. Uh, so it's more of a mathematical model and less of a biological model. So I wanted to address that. So we're thinking always in terms of the biology first and foremost. Um, the old system and the new system uh, relates to sensitivity to organic pollution. So I just wanted to do a little aside of what or organic pollution means because when you deal with your, when you talk to your volunteers about what these numbers mean, um, this is particularly uh, important. It's good to know what exactly that refers to. So, um, Organic pollution is, it's both point and non-point source pollution. It comes from, you know, it's, it, it has natural causes, but as well as probably bigger causes, agricultural and urban. And it's specifically referring to wastewater and fertilizers and nutrients and pesticides. You know, the, pollutions that, the pollution that's coming into our systems that is carbon-based. And that has always been strongly connected to oxygen levels. So. BOD, you've probably heard of BOD, biological oxygen demand. Uh, these are all uh, materials that once they get into systems and decay, it takes up oxygen. So technically speaking, that is when you're talking about sensitivity with macroinvertebrates, it's specifically talking about the amount of those materials and how uh, likely it is for the presence of those materials to knock out 
that taxa from the um, from its pre from the from the presence in the stream. But secondarily, it's it, these bugs, these insects are strongly connected to habitat quality and flow. Um, that's just because there's such a high correlation between amount of organic pollution and uh, habitat quality. Areas with higher organic pollution will typically have more degraded habitat. So uh, that means bank erosion, my list here, fine sediment, flashy water flows, channelized streams, riparian, less riparian cover, less woody debris, less habitat. All that stuff is heavily correlated with the amount of organic pollution. So when you talk about sensitivity with your volunteers, you can stress, well, it's primarily this, but the result of all of this organic pollution is typically highly connected to all these other things that maybe you can more visually see. You know, the stuff on the bottom with habitat is, is kind of what they, it's kind of like the image that, that they get when they go to the stream. So all of that stuff is wrapped into those, those sensitivity ratings. So just keep that in mind as that's what all this, this is getting at when we, when we go through uh, these changes. Um, I talked about some of the stuff already. Uh, yeah, so it's just good to remind uh, any model that is kind of more categorical and less continuous is more of an abstraction from reality. So I'm interested in bringing our scoring back closer to uh, realism and what's happening out there in the world. Um, and we've also just seen over time uh, and repeated exposure for me to see how groups handle this identification scheme that there's certain mistakes that kind of every group tends to do and they can So I'm trying to, uh, I want a scheme that can minimize those mistakes. Okay, so um, this is what, this is the plan then. Uh, the current scheme is kind of using these sensitivity terminologies, but not really fully embrace, embracing this Hilsenhoff index of bio, biotic integrity. So my plan for my core then is to go with full-fledged Hilsenhoff index. Um, this is a established procedure that is uh, well supported in the scientific literature and many other groups do it. So, uh, the, the, current, the current system is something that only Michigan MyCore does, but we're gonna, gonna go, we're gonna alter it slightly so that we're just doing the Hilsenhoff index um, and we'll be in line with lots of other groups. Uh, one thing that has to happen though, is to make it volunteer friendly, there's certain uh, compromises that, that we have to put in. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next few slides. Um, uh, in for the Hilsenhoff, what we'll see is that each taxa is rated from zero to 10, um, where, and it's like bowling score. So uh, the lower numbers are the most pollution sensitive. Those are sensitive. Well, up to 10 would be like a leech, something that's the most pollution tolerant. So what we have to do to convert our score or our system into the Hilsenhoff system is to uh, assign those tolerance values to all of our groups. So what I did to, to accomplish this is I went into our family level data sheet and went into the literature and looked up those tolerance values for every uh, taxa that we, we have in Michigan. Um, and you can see the range here, like the hemipterans at the top left the bellostomata, that's your giant water bug, you know, that actually scores a 10 on, on this scheme, so very pollution tolerant. Well, the Jaredae, which is a water strider, scores uh, just a five. So you can see how within these groups you, you get this range. Um, caddisflies, you know, there's even a caddisfly, the Odontoceridae, which is a zero. Uh, but then you can have something as pollution tolerant as a melanidae, which is a six. So that's one way that um, you can see the old system by putting everything into really specific categories was losing some of that specificity. But I'm not asking people to identify at the family level. This is just serving as kind of the data uh, baseline. 
for, for how we're going to figure out the numbers to assign to the groups. So what I did was I then went through and I took averages of all those families to produce a um, an average for each group. And then I assign, I put them on, on the old system and you can then see how things uh, maybe are an error with the way we used to do this. Helgramites, for example, the most uh, pollution sensitive thing we have are basically treated the same in our scoring system as the right-handed snails, which is a six. And then you'll have something like um, uh, alderfly, uh, which is uh, somewhat sensitive with a four, being treated like basically less for the total scoring as compared to a water penny, which is a same number, also a four. So those are things that we want to alter. Here's the bottom of the data sheet. You know, damsel flies are an average of of 7.7. And in the semi-sensitive group, and that they're actually worse than some of the things marked as tolerant. So what we want to do is have a reordering of all of these taxa so that the score, the final end score, can be more properly calculated. So these are the, the adjustments then that are needed to be made to, to fix some of those problems. Um, what we're going to do uh, for beetles is we're not going to treat water pennies differently than other beetles. Water pennies are scored a, a four, but most beetles are actually a five. Um, we also had triple counted beetles because we had a line for water penny adults and larvae. So the fix to that is just to have a single beetle line in our, in our final scheme, which I'll show you at the end of all this. Um, mollusks, mollusks, uh, including snails and clams, uh, they are not, they're very cool biologically, and uh, I don't want to minimize that, but from a water quality perspective, they're not really uh, very interesting. Uh, they're not really indicator species. Um, so from a scoring system that concentrates on uh, producing a water quality score, having a single line for mollusks is really all we need, especially when they all range from about a six to eight on that scale. So what we're gonna do is just, just have a single line for clams, a single line for snails. So it simplifies things and um, your volunteers no longer have to know how to tell the different snails apart, for example. Caddisflies. This was an area that um, that I think had a lot of errors in it because we used to ask you to to separate the net spinning caddisflies, the hydrocycids, as a different group from every other type of caddisfly. But the thing is, there's a lot of taxa that look a lot like hydrocycids, and I think um, a lot of those were being put erroneously into the hydrocycid category. Um, if, and then when I was looking at the, the ratings, I realized hydrocycids are at a four, but the typical caddis fly that is not a hydrocycid is a three. So really the, the scoring is very similar across all of the, all the caddis flies. So we're gonna minimize volunteer identification errors and just have a single line for caddis flies. So we're just going to say all caddis flies are given uh, a single score, the average of which is a 3.2. Um, dragonflies. So dragonflies have a tremendous range in their sensitivity ratings. There's the gomphid, that's the family name, club-tailed dragonflies. They're actually really, really sensitive and they're basically the same as a stonefly in terms of their sensitivity. They have a, a one. And then you see other dragonflies range somewhere between a two and a nine. So just this tremendous diverse range. So um, what I wanna do is split the gomphids apart into their own very sensitive group that is going to have a score of a one. 
Uh, and then every other type of dragonfly is going to kind of be uh, treated as, as a group. Um, now there are even dragonflies that are rated two, so why not break those apart as well? Well, we have this issue where it's really hard to tell the difference between Cordula Day, which is a two, and Libellula Day, which is a nine. Those look so similar. So um, we're gonna, because of that, I didn't wanna introduce that level of complexity to our volunteer-based system. So what we're gonna do is have, just have the gomphid group and gomphids are very easy to identify even without a microscope uh, once you learn there a couple of tricks. And then we'll have all the other dragonflies. Um, so with, with an average tolerance of four. So that's not perfect, obviously, but we're making compromises for a volunteer-based system. And um, I think uh, one of the things that we're, we're gonna, that's happening with this change is that you'll see more of a value in going to that family level so that you are able to start breaking uh, those groups apart into their individual families. You'll get better results as, at the whole. But even at the, the basic level, it still will produce better data um, with this new system. Now, dipterins. Dipterins were bad in the old system, and they're still bad in the new system. I can't, I can't fix them. Uh, they're hard to identify. They all look like wormy things. Um, the reason that it was bad in the old system is that we had this catch-all category right here at the very bottom of the list. You know, anything that isn't one of these other things gets down here in the tolerant group, uh, and that that was biologically problematic because some of those other things were rated like at a one or a two. Um, so we were putting really sensitive um, dipterins in this tolerant group. So I want so the, the fixes I'm putting in here require you to learn new dipterins, new specific dipterins. Um, uh, but it shouldn't be any harder than the way it used to be. It'll just be different. It's not any easier either. So what I'm gonna do is now have three groups for dipterins because we have some really sensitive dipterins uh, listed here. The water snipe fly, which is what was sensitive in the old system. Then there's a new one, there's two new ones. There's a net winged midge, which is also rated as a one uh, and, and a very rare one. You might not ever even see it, but it's very easy to identify once you once you see some pictures and the Dixid midge. So those are all true flies that are quite sensitive. Now you have the very large block of somewhat sensitive true flies and they're going to be rated on average a six. And once again, this is kind of a bit of a catch-all category. It's gonna include stuff like black fly larva and crane fly larva and midges kind of all the groups that you uh, were used to looking at and I pulling out and identifying separately. Then we're gonna have a third group of really tolerant true flies like the mosquito, uh, the rat-tailed maggot, the soldier fly. These are all like almost wetland or still water taxa that don't really need any oxygen. So on the average, they get an 8.7. So the new system, this new system for dipterins is more biologically accurate. It will be challenging. You still have to learn those specific groups. Okay, so this is putting all that together. This is what it looks like. Um, we got. Uh, we're not. We're not. Notice we're not using categories anymore. Instead, what we have is a continuous rating. So helgramites are our most sensitive with a, uh, a score of zero. And then we have it right, you know, we have the scores right on here because that's actually used in the final scoring of, of the system. Uh, it goes all the way down through aquatic worms and leeches at a 10. So this is really useful for um, volunteers that they can kind of see that's overall continuum of, of how uh, these uh, different tax of, uh, are affected by organic pollution as well as all those habitat uh, degradation changes that, that occur. So this is actually what the back of the new data sheet looks like. 
Um, okay, so we're gonna walk through then how you score it. It's 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 pretty easy. Um, it's it's somewhat intuitive actually, but let's we'll walk we'll walk through it. Um, one thing that that is you have to recognize is that uh, the Hilsenhoff IBI, which is what this is, just simplified into these groups instead of genus species. Um, it is supposed to be done with an abundance of 100. And that is because uh, at really, really low abundances, the, 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 the score totally skews off wrong. So as an extreme example, let's say you went to a stream and you look for an hour and you can only find one thing because the stream is that bad and it just happens to be a stonefly. Um, because maybe it just, uh, I don't know, it got washed down from a nicer location. And so you just, you, all you do is find this, this one stone fly and that's it. Under, if you were just to score that naturally uh, with the system, you would end up with a final score of 1.3 out of 10 and it would be considered a highly excellent stream, right? So that's an extreme example, but it shows how if you don't have enough abundance, the scoring system just doesn't work. So this required a little bit of um, professional judgment. And in conversations with, with Gary Colehep and Marcy from, from Eagle, we made the determination that uh, there needs to be a first pass of just the looking at abundance. And what we're gonna say is if you can't find 30 total uh, insects or macros in an hour, the hour that you're at the stream, that we're just gonna score that a 10. Um, if you can't, if, you, if you're less than 60, uh, then it's an automatic seven. Now, if you get 60 or above, then you can score this as normal and you should get a fairly accurate score. Uh, but your overall goal, what you should be telling your volunteers is that we want to find at least 100 at this location and then and then typically more is better the more you find um the more different taxa you're going to find uh you'll get a better sense of the of the uh, relative abundances between groups and so anything anything above 100 is great now uh, that's that's kind of what you're striving for oh uh, you'll also notice that we're not recording things as common or rare anymore we're we're ref gonna record total count. So we're, we're actually going to be counting those because the distribution of that, of, of uh, the different taxa is uh, important. If you only find one, one stonefly, it shouldn't be treated the same as finding nine stoneflies, in other words, which is what the old system had. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. This is just a hypothetical example here. I just made up some numbers. Um, we did our sampling and we found one Helgramite, we found 35 caddisflies, and so on on the left hand side of the screen. Then what you do is you just multiply across. So one times the sensitivity rating equals zero. Uh, and you do that for every line. 35 times the sensitivity rating for caddisfly of 3.2 is 112. So that's what's recorded in this column here is, is multiplying that across and so on. Um, then you add up that entire column and you get this number here. So we got 335. Basically, this is, I mean, this is just a weighted, this is a fancy weighted average is what is what we're we're doing here, where the insect count is actually the uh, um, the weight. Um, okay, and then to get your final water quality rating, your WQR as we'll call it, you divide that sum right here by the total abundance. So in this case, that gives us a 4.47. Um, and we'll refer to our chart. So it's just on the borderline of the very good to good category. And so that then is your final score for this site. All right, let me take a look at the time. All right, um, 
So that's that's the new system. I think it's really cool. I think it in terms of biologically, it makes um, more sense and is a little more intuitive, I think, for how the score is calculated. So your volunteers can more directly see how the score relates to the to the insect count. Uh, but there's a problem um, for you people uh, like myself who've been doing this for a long time, and that's that what about your long term trends? Uh, one of the most important things that we've been doing is not just each individual sample, but it's over the course of a decade, how is the stream changing? And this is a problem uh, switching to a new system. And uh, I'm just, you know, you just have to own that and recognize that these systems are not 100% equivalent. Uh, we're changing some of the, uh, some of what was considered, considered sensitive as uh, what's considered sensitive now. Um, and um, if you try to graph this out, so here's like an example of a of the old scoring system that went from zero to, you know, 50 at, or even higher. This is Arms Creek, one of my sample sites, and this is what it looked like over the course of, uh, you know, of its of us monitoring it using the old system. Now, if you were to then suddenly just start the new system without accounting for anything, you would end up with something that looked like that, you know, so uh, everything's between zero and 10. Uh, obviously, they're totally incompatible. You can't just transfer from one system to, to the other without making some, some alterations. So I have been thinking about this for a while. I've come up with a few options for you. Some of them are good and some of them not so good. Uh, all of them require a little bit of work. First of all, if you've always been a group, and there's a few who've always identified everything to the family level, uh, this change actually only helps you. Uh, we didn't even have a scoring system for family level identifications uh, before. Um, so now the, you, you can do the scoring system at the family level and it's completely compatible. You just do it the exact same way, except you're identifying uh, 70 different taxa instead of, instead of just about the, you know, the 15 or so that we have in, in the simpler list. So to do this, all you need to really do is go back to your old data and uh, score it with, with the new tolerance numbers and you'll have um, a whole new set of, of long-term trends to, that you didn't have before uh, doing things at the, the family level. So you also have the family level uh, because it's sensitivity ratings for each taxa and you can then make a difference between a uh, Cordulidae and a Libellulidae dragonfly and see the changes in the score. So it gives, it does give you more accurate results, which is, so it's great. It's a, it's a good thing for people who've always done this. Um, now, uh, another option. So now just talking about if you've always identified things with the old system, not family level, but the bigger order level identification. Uh, if you don't have a lot of data, if your group is new at this um, and you don't really have that many sample sites and you have kept all your old samples, which I, I always uh, tell people to do and some people do and some people don't, but if you keep your old samples, you should be able to go back to them and rescore them with this new system. Um, it's ultimately up to you how much work you want to put into that. Uh, my experience is it's a lot easier to re uh, go through a jar for the second time as compared to the first time. That's because when you have this nice, clean sample that you've already picked the insects out of, it's not going to be full of bits of muck and debris that you have to sort through, but you'll just get a pile of macros and they're all macros and you don't have to worry about finding that little leaf and pulling it out. And you can generally do those pretty quick. So, you know, ask volunteers to come in and help you do it. Uh, you can knock, maybe knock a whole bunch out in a couple afternoons and then 
you don't have to worry about the old system anymore. You'll just have all this, all this data in, in the new system. Uh, some groups maybe have been monitoring for 20 years and you're not really interested in doing that. So uh, here's another option. Uh, proceeding forward from this point, use both methods. So you'll have an overlap uh, time period in which three to five years, you'll score things both, both ways. And then that will enable you to determine um, if, if, there's, if, that, if that trend continues or if it um, maybe disappears because you're, you're, you're measuring it under both ways that will give you new baseline data uh, to see, if, see what happens to your trend. Um, if that, sorry, I may not explain that very well, but in any case, there's a transition data sheet that I made up um, that looks like this, and that's on our, on our website where all the other data sheets are, where if you, if you use this as your primary uh, sheet that you use when you do identification, um, you'll have everything you need for both systems. So you just fill this out and then you can take the old system and the new system and score both of them and, and you would have a score for both systems. So this is every, for example, you know, it has a club tail dragonflies pulled out, but also has all, all other dragonflies. Well, with that information and the old system, you'll be able to say if it's common or dragonflies are common and rare and give it the proper score in the, in the old system. But you also have the, the, the dragon, the club tails pulled out so you can score it in the new system. So, so that's a possibility. Just do both for a while. Wait till you have some good baseline data and then just stop doing it the old way. Okay. Um, Conversion, uh, so, so here's option four, which I spent a good amount of time trying it. And honestly, I can't recommend it, recommend it, but I tried it. So I wanted to tell you I tried it. Um, and that's to rescale your old SQI scores. That's the old system. So the way this, the reason this is possible is because uh, we have points on both scoring systems that essentially are supposed to mean the same thing. So in the, in the, what was used to be a 48 in the old system at that border of excellent and good, in our new system, that's a 3.5 and so on. You can see that there's areas on the scaling scheme and that, that scheme that are supposed to mean the same thing, biologically speaking. So what I did was I uh, figured out an equation that can convert one to the other pretty, not, not within every hundredth of a point, but pretty close. So that if you were to take all of your old scores and do this equation, it can turn it into something that scales between zero and 10. So I was hoping that this would just work, but it's not uh, foolproof because uh, essentially the two systems are looking at the biology in slightly different ways. And there's some overlap there, but there's also differences um, so I tested it on all of my past data. I have 1,542 past collections. Um, and I, and I did it for, I did this for, for everything. So I have, you know, the, here's SQI. That's my old, that's the old score. And then I converted it using that equation. But then I also just scored it properly with the new system. And I ended up with a correlation of 0.52 between those two scores. So 0.52 correlation means there is a correlation, but it's not a very uh, super strong correlation. You know, it shows that there's some kind of relationship there, but, um, but it, it, I was hoping for more of a correlation of 0.8. And when I got a 0.52, then I knew that this, this conversion method wasn't, uh, isn't the best way to do it. And I'll just show an example. Um, sometimes it works great. Uh, here is uh, one of my sites where the black line is when I use the equation and I converted the score. 
and the yellow line is when it's just scored normally. And actually for this particular site, you can see there's individual samples that are, are way different. Like here's one, there's a huge difference between the converted score and how it actually scored. But overall, the trend is was very similar. So I was like, okay, well that shows that it can work for this particular site, but it probably has to do with the taxa. Um, if there's a lot of the, if there's a lot of the tax of in the between the two systems that didn't that wasn't really altered with the scoring scheme, then then it's going to be more likely that uh, that it the system would work. But then I did it on another site, and this one shows uh, quite a bit a different trend. I mean the the black line is slightly going up, and the yellow line is actually slightly going down. So I was like, okay, so this. In this case, converting your scores that way didn't really work at all for me. Uh, I actually produced counter uh, counterintuitive uh, results to each other. So, so I was like, well, I wanted to tell you guys about it that I tried converting the scores like that, but but um, I I don't know if I can recommend it. I think picking one of the other methods is a, a better way to go. Okay, so. Wrapping up, then we'll have about uh, a few minutes for questions anyway. Um, so, you know, I'm not doing this to create more work for all of you. I think it's long been overdue to kind of update the scoring scheme so it's more biologically accurate. Um, the Hilsenhoff IBI has broad acceptance in this community. Uh, lots of groups do it. It has scientific literature that you can go and read about it. So it has this more uh, solid backing. Um, and because of all of that, I, I do believe that the results you will get will be better results and more useful for management purposes in terms of figuring out where your bad places are and where your good places are. Uh, and then as you just heard, I'm still trying to figure out the conversion of old data. I do think the best option is to simply rescore your old samples with a little, a little, maybe a lot of uh, work. Uh, the good thing about rescoring them is that you will get really good identifying macroinvertebrates. So it has that aspect to it. And you know, feel free to try things out for yourself and see. Maybe you want to try that equation and convert your scores over and see. Maybe your correlation will be higher than mine, and you can trust you'll you'll trust it more than than I do. Um, in terms of data entry, so over the course of the next few years, we're going to be completely overhauling our database. And I don't really have a timeline except that it, it's going to happen. Uh, we also don't have the new, a new data form on, on the database yet for this new method. So start, you know, in your next, start doing this if you can in your next sample. But uh, don't worry about entering the data into the database yet. Just hold on to it uh, for now. Hold on to those data sheets. Put it in your own database, and uh, we will we will fix that soon. Um, in terms of sharing your results, of course, you still have the op opportunity to share results uh, with me, with Eagle Biologists, your stakeholders. Don't rely on the database to do that for you, but you know that's part of what these these fact sheets. If you have a maintenance grant, is an opportunity for you to get your results out there to the people who want to see them. So you'll still be able to incorporate those results into your into your yearly fact sheets. All right, so I'm going to open up the Q and A. That's everything I had to say. I want to see what people are asking about. Um, anonymous attendee says. Uh, excellent. Isn't there a high probability of macroinvertebrates in both high and low sensitivity occur? If so uh, the low down will, oh yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I mean, that's, yep, yeah, that's, okay, so someone's asking, hey, I got both good and bad stuff in my stream. Would that pull down the grade? Yep, that's how this is designed. <laughs> and that's, and that's, and that is then the reality of your um, your stream. Now, if you have a really good stream, 
the chances are you're going to find a lot more of those higher sensitivities and they should uh, overwhelm the uh, the impact of the lower uh, sensitivity ones. So you still should end up with an accurate answer. Um, will Sarah asks, will the family level scoring sheet with the rankings be sent out so we can update the scores? Um, yes, actually it exists. It's it's online with all the other stream documents. You can get it get it right now. If you go to mycore.net and go to streams and then stream documents, you can get the family level scoring sheet. Uh, Sally, do most groups keep all of the insects found? Uh, yes, most groups do. That's um, that's what I uh, tell people to do. That's in our official procedures of that you keep everything. Um, so, yep. Uh, if you don't, you should. Um, Kathy asks, what if we didn't keep more than 10 of each type? Because once we reach 10, we didn't need anything more to classify as common. Sure. All right. Well, in that case, you can't really rescore it. Um, your old samples and you will have to do the option where you score things under both methods for several years to see if that trend changes. And if it doesn't, then fade out the old version and keep the new version. Um, Sarah Baker says, when doing both methods at some of our site this year, we got Significantly different water quality ratings. For example, at one site that's always ranked as excellent with a new sheet, it ranked good. How do we justify this to the general public who will jump to the conclusion that the water quality is dropping in that location? I mean, I guess you just have to tell them, uh, just, you just tell them the truth that you're using a different system. The old system had some flaws in it and maybe it was never excellent, um, but uh, it, it's always been in this good category. So I mean that's what I, I that's what I would do. I would just say that you you switched to a more uh, accurate rating system, and it's the, the stream is good. Um, we found the population of New Zealand mud snails yuck at one of our streams this spring, and collected quite a few of them in our sample. How do we score these on the data sheet? So you would just treat those as gastropods, uh, mollusks and score them with uh, the number given on that line. Of course, uh, that's a bad thing uh, that you found them at all, but that's kind of like a different issue than the water quality. So, you know, you I'm sure you have been in contact with Eagle and DNR about that. Um, but as far as the water quality rating, it still just goes, goes under, the, um, under that mollusk line. Okay, Heather had the kind of the same, Heather Smith had this kind of the same question. It was like, we stopped at, we stopped collecting at 11 individuals. So they don't, they, they won't be able to go back and rescore their samples either. They'll have to um, just, just do both methods for several years and eventually phase out the old method once a proper uh, data baseline is established. Uh, Carolyn, <laughs> Carolyn wants me to state again where they are on the web page. So it's super easy. So if you go to our main mycore.net web page, um, there is a there's like lakes and streams. Our main main drop down menu. So just pick streams, and then um, and and then it's just a stream documents. And then what we have is all our stuff just listed right there in a row the family level data sheet, the order level data sheet, the procedures, this new transition data sheet. How many years do you recommend we keep space for storage is a concern. Uh, the uh, official guidance of my core is that you keep things for five years. Uh, some groups that have kept them forever then will of course have a more easy way to uh, going about and rescoring them. But Five years is what we say you should keep your samples. Uh, do you count invasives as part of the score? We do. We don't ask. We don't ask people to um, to distinguish between those. Uh, Tom Tissue says, "Are you going to publish a paper on the design of the new method, its advantages and drawbacks?" Well, Tom's a professor, so he thinks in terms of papers. I'm not a professor. Um, 
maybe i mean maybe that's something we could do uh i'm happy to collaborate with people on it uh but i usually just don't have the, the space to to be publishing myself so i would help you on it tom if you wanted to take the lead uh it's certainly an, an interesting question i think and it could be useful to the program right yep in terms of peer review yep so we can get acceptance uh, more broadly, uh, though, you know, the new method is widely published in the literature under the Hilson Huff IBI. I suppose the difference is, is that we are uh, averaging things within groups. And so that makes it a little unique. Um, I'll have to look a little bit to see if, if that is a common thing or if people doing Hilson Huff usually go to the genus species level. Yeah, <laughs> Hilson. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's basically, I'd say three fourths. It's three fourths Hilsenhoff. Um, half Hilson's probably the way we did it before. So, um, okay, so what, what we have to do is take a little bit of a break here because some of you guys, I'm sure, will, will disappear for a while. Um, after lunch, Tamara is going to be going through all the insect ID. Um, so, You'll definitely want to come back for that so you can see the, the new groups that exist in this new system. Um, but there might be other things on the agenda that interest you, you as well, of course. And what we'll do is at 10 o'clock, we're going to start the introduction to my core. So, you know, taking a, taking a big step back from what we just talked about now and talking to the, to the new groups who have just come in. So thank you, everybody, for your questions and listening and uh, hopefully we see you all uh, sometime today.